The popular image of the Cold War period is of two opposing ideological systems facing off against each other, each with their own formidable military alliances to back them up. NATO on one side, the Warsaw Pact on the other, the United States and the Soviet Union both use these treaties to exert influence and each promote their ideologies and values. But, shocking as it may be for some people, these European-focused alliances largely ignored much of the rest of the world. As it became increasingly clear that the United Nations, the organization intended to promote and ensure world peace, was largely stillborn in this primary goal, a series of additional regional and international defense treaties began to be formed. But importantly, this really only happened on one side of the ideological divide. While the Soviet Union formed strong bilateral relations with many socialist states, outside of the Warsaw Pact, it didn't form any regional defensive pacts. The United States, on the other hand, in line with the Truman Doctrine, began encouraging and participating in various regional defense treaties to help prevent the spread of communism. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at CENTO, CIATO, and ANZUS, three of the more notable regional treaties. This is the Cold War. So we're going to start with the largest of the three, CIATO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. Formed in 1954 by the signing of the Manila Pact, it was made up of the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan, the Philippines, and Thailand. A pretty diverse group of countries, and not exactly bound by the geographic designation that the name of the treaty would imply. So what brought them all together? Aside from stopping the spread of communism, of course. Well, to answer that, we need to look at the evolving defense relationships that the US already had with each of these countries leading up to the treaty signing. Bilateral defense agreements were already in place with both Pakistan and with the Philippines, while Australia and New Zealand had already formed the ANZUS Treaty, which we will talk about shortly. In addition, Washington was already providing both economic and military aid to Thailand, although this was being done without any formal security guarantees. And of course, the US already had started cooperating with Vietnam. All this to say that a framework for an organization was already in place. Now, why were these countries seeking a defensive pact in the first place? Well, let's start with the two countries that, geographically, aren't like the others. The United Kingdom, with its longtime interest in the region, and its continued colonial holdings in places like Malaya, Hong Kong, and Singapore, saw the defensive pact as an opportunity to continue their influence in the region as well as help maintain the empire. France, despite its losing position in Indochina, wanted to try and continue to exert their own influence in Southeast Asia. New Zealand and Australia, as dominions of Great Britain, recognized that the empire and its protections were a spent power and were seeking new defensive partners. Pakistan was seeking allies as the animosity with India continued to deepen. The Philippines, with its own bilateral defensive agreement with the United States already secured, looked to deepen its relationship with both the US as well as other countries in the region. Thailand, despite being in the US sphere of influence, did not yet have a formal agreement with the United States and was looking for reassurance in the face of a perceived Chinese threat after the PRC had created the Thai Autonomous Region in Yunnan Province. It was feared that this region would be used as a pretext for a communist overthrow of Thailand. So all those nations had some vested interest in an alliance. But as any of you who have ever looked at a map know, there are still several other nations in Southeast Asia that could have joined. Indonesia and Burma both preferred to maintain their status as neutral countries and rejected any possibility of joining. The former French colonies of Indochina, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia were prohibited from joining any international military alliances by the terms of the 1954 Geneva Agreement. Now, with the creation of CIATO, a new military bloc was formed, just like NATO, right? Well, no, not at all. For one thing, unlike NATO, CIATO lacked a joint military command structure, so in the event of a war, each country would fight independently and not be able to coordinate any war effort. 
Seato also lacked its equivalent to Article 5 in the NATO Treaty. For those who may not recall from our episode on NATO, Article 5 states that, quote, The parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all, end quote. So the Defensive Military Pact lacked a collective security clause. Possibly not the best defensive pact when you stop and think about it. Seattle had fundamental problems right from the outset. Due to the predominance of non-regional members, it was not seen as necessarily acting in the region's best interests, but rather for the interests of those non-regional partners. This is best typified in the case of Laos when that country invited Seato to intervene militarily in their ongoing civil war, but were blocked by the United Kingdom and France. Pakistan, the seeming outlier in that it was not really part of the region, nor was it a former colonial master, had joined looking for allies to help in its struggle with India. But given that Seato was an explicitly anti-communist organization, Pakistan did not find the support it was hoping for it actually ended up withdrawing from Seato in 1972. So where did Seato act on its stated goal? Well, believe it or not, it was in Vietnam. The US cited its obligation as a Seato member to begin dispatching aid and troops to Vietnam. Would the US have sent troops to Vietnam even without being a part of Seato? Yeah, we can safely assume that they would have, but the organization did provide a veneer of diplomatic legitimacy, however thin, to mounting intervention in Southeast Asia. The only other member nations to provide troops in Vietnam under the Seato umbrella were Australia and New Zealand. Other member nations declined intervention. With the triumph of communist forces in South Vietnam in 1975, a clear failure to the Seato mandate, France opted to withdraw its financial support to the organization. The writing was on the wall. Seato was a relatively toothless organization that did have clear aims, but lacked clear unity or direction on how to achieve those aims. Seato was dissolved in 1977. 1955 saw the signing of the Baghdad Pact, a regional defense organization made up of Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, and the United Kingdom. This was the organization that was renamed the Central Treaty Organization, or CENTO, only three years later after Iraq withdrew from it. More on that in a minute. In general, CENTO was fairly similar to Seato in that it was a Western-backed defensive alliance with a stated aim of preventing the spread of communism in the region. Many of you may be asking yourselves why the US wasn't a part of CENTO. Well, it was a backer and a strong supporter of the treaty but some of the larger geopolitics of the region prevented their joining. And that geopolitical issue? Well, to put simply, Israel. The US knew that the powerful pro-Israel lobby in Congress would never allow for the ratification of an alliance with countries considered hostile to the Jewish state. So was Cento facing an uphill battle for success? Well, yes. Though not only because of Israel, although that was a significant factor. Open American support for Israel was always going to create doubts in the minds of the other Middle Eastern CENTO members. If a war broke out in the region, which would likely involve Israel, there were large doubts that the US would side with the CENTO members in that fight. CENTO's success was also hamstrung by rising Arab nationalism. By definition, that movement was anti-colonial and therefore by association was anti-Western. For an alliance that included the United Kingdom, this was an issue. Related to the feelings of anti-colonialism was a preference for many Arab countries to cooperate with the Soviet Union. Moscow had no history of colonialism in the region, making them a less prickly option to deal with. Finally, for a defensive alliance that was supposed to be about stopping communism, at least one country had joined almost exclusively looking for allies in its struggle with India. We're still looking at you, Pakistan. Now, how was CENTO set up? Well, it was similar to Seato in that although it was a defensive treaty, there was no central military command nor formal declarations to defend one another in the event of being attacked. The impact of this became crystal clear as early as 1956 during the Suez Crisis. No member nation of CENTO came to the assistance of the United Kingdom. In fact, the only action taken by a CENTO party was in the form of the United States forcing London to step down from its military position. 
Not only was the pride of the United Kingdom severely hurt in the crisis, but the recruitment drive for new CENTO members in the region was stunted, to say the least. What Arab country wanted to be in an open partnership with the UK after that? So from all this, it isn't hard to conclude that CENTO was largely stillborn as an organization. 1958, the Iraqi monarchy was overthrown by a free officers movement, and the Iraqi Republic established under Abd al-Karim Qasim, who took the step of withdrawing Iraq from CENTO. Pakistan, not necessarily aligned with the goals of the pact, called on support from its allies against India, but at best got only pledges of neutrality or verbal support, sort of like diplomatic thoughts and prayers. It should be noted that while the US did provide aid to Pakistan, that was done so as part of a separate bilateral agreement, and not via CENTO. There we have it, a defensive alliance with no commitments to provide aid, member states that not only had different aims from the pact itself, but actively distrusted other members, and in some cases, actually preferred to do business with the nations the pact was formed to help stop. As Soviet influence grew in the Arab world, it was clear that CENTO was ineffective at best. By the late 1970s, the writing was on the wall, and in 1979, it was officially disbanded. The third organization we're going to talk about is actually the oldest of the three and can be considered the most successful. Established in 1951 and only comprised of three nations, the San Francisco Treaty established the Australia-New Zealand-United States Security Treaty, better known as ANZUS. It was originally formed to help allay fears held by both Australia and New Zealand of a possible resurgent Japan in the face of the so-called soft peace being established by the US occupation forces there. Australia and New Zealand had long relied on Great Britain for protection on the world stage, but with the collapsing empire, they had begun casting for new friends. The United States, with whom they had worked closely during the Second World War, was an obvious and logical choice. The victory of the communists in China in their civil war spurred on the need to create an alliance, hence the formation of ANZUS. The treaty, like the other two, still lacked an Article 5-style clause obliging members to act in the event of an attack, but did include this in its own Article 4. Quote, Each party recognizes that an armed attack in the Pacific area on any of the parties would be dangerous to its own peace and safety, and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with its constitutional processes. End quote. Not exactly ironclad, but, well, better than nothing. Now, also like the other two, no formal joint command structure was established, but ANZUS had the advantage that the member states had a decades-long relationship of cooperation with each other, including a history of joint military exercises and intelligence gathering. Both Australia and New Zealand would go on to support the United States in their efforts to prevent the spread of communism in the region, including Southeast Asia, and even supported US military intervention into Vietnam. ANZUS still exists today, although its current format is somewhat modified as a result of a falling out between New Zealand and the United States in 1984 as a result of the disclosure, or well, non-disclosure, of nuclear weapons on board US ships in New Zealand's territory. We'll cover that when we get to the 1980s. It just might be a while. So that's the three treaties. None of them have played a tremendous role on the military or political stage of the Cold War. They're all marked by a lack of clear forms of required action in the event of an attack on a member state. Most of them were made up of members who either had opposite goals from other member nations or actively distrusted the other states. They were all alliances formed at the encouragement of the United States seeking to halt the spread of communism, but the one thing in common between all of the member nations was the pre-existence of bilateral military ties to Washington. The US didn't need larger regional alliances to be formed, they were more of a form of political grandstanding. Were they effective? Not really. Were they necessary? Probably not. But most importantly, were they successful in their stated aims? Well, only ANZUS can claim to have fulfilled its role, but that was very possibly only as a result of the long-standing relationship that both Australia and New Zealand already had with each other. The other two were failures. For organizations meant to halt the spread of communism, 
one need only look to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia in Southeast Asia, or to the thousands of Soviet tanks and aircraft sold and deployed by nations in the Middle East to figure out that Cento and Sieto were pretty much paper tigers. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and to make sure you don't miss all of our future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have allied yourself to the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated.